Well, good morning again, and what a great day to give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His faithfulness endures forever. Can you feel it? Do you believe it? Do you live it? Do you let other people know about it? And so before I get going, uh, why don't you take a second and subscribe? We have uh, officially passed the 300 subscribers uh, Mark, and uh, for those of you who are watching, you know, crazy bungee jumps and epic fails on YouTube, uh, maybe you think that 300 subscribers is no big deal, but that's not true. It is important, and uh, so take a moment and subscribe and pay attention to some of the videos that we're putting out uh, for you. Um, take a few minutes also to look at the, this week's edition of our newsletter. You can subscribe using the link below. Uh, and as we do every Sunday, we want you to know that if you have questions, you need support or prayer, there is a way to contact us right away using the phone number that is right now on the screen. And uh, that is just about it for me right now. Tanya is coming now with a, a few announcements. Hi, Tanya! Thank you, Paul, for that welcome. Now for announcements. Girlfriends Inc. is launching an online book club on Zoom starting June 30th at 7 p.m., running for nine weeks. Pastor Anna is going to be facilitating this, and we're going to be reading the book called Ageless by Maria Dorso. And she outlines nine key principles for living a youthful life regardless of your age. She talks about being fearless, being tireless, being selfless and is really also very keen on bringing the different generations together. So this is for those of you that are in your 20s and those of you that are in your 70s and 80s. It doesn't matter how old you are. The one thing you have to do is buy the book. You can do so on Amazon for $19.63 and also register in the description box below. Uh, there's also a link on the newsletter that you received as well as on the app. So register today and uh, let's get this thing started. If you've been wondering how to invite your friends and family to our online services and are maybe unsure how to do it, we've created an online invite for you. It's in the description box below. You can use it across all your social media platforms to reach out to those that are in your circle directly. So we hope that you find it helpful. Now it's time for our tithes and offerings. We thank you again for your ongoing support as we just continue to endeavor into new territory week to week here and you can give by doing so on our app, on our website, by mail, or by dropping it off in the mail slot at our church building. Now on to Nat and Mel for worship. All right, good morning, everybody. It's good to be with you again. We're looking forward to worshiping uh, together. As you can tell, we're back at the church uh, this morning. And uh, just on that note, you might catch uh, Dave, our custodian, or Pastor Ron, um, just wandering in the back, maybe by accident or whatever. But um, just keep your eyes focused on Jesus and uh, and your focus on on Him this morning uh, as we as we go to worship. Uh, before we do though, um, there's a scripture I just wanted to to read. It's uh, from Hebrews 12. And it says, "Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up." And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. So we're going to do that this morning. Uh, for some of us, that might be uh, more things to shake off than, than others. But we all have something this morning that uh, with the help and, and the power of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, um, that we, we can shake off and, and, and keep our eyes and our attention focused on him this morning. from dust you came and you lived among us you took on our frame you walked in our pain and now you're taking us higher you stepped into time You lay down your life to save us. 
You took on our shame On the cross it was laid And now you're taking us higher We go from glory to glory to glory Never be the same We'll never be the same we go from glory to glory to glory we're forever changed we're forever changed you call me your friend Brought into your endless kingdom By the blood I was made No longer a slave And now you're taking us higher And we go from glory to glory to glory We'll never be the same We'll never be the same we go from glory to glory to glory We're forever changed We're forever changed Until we reach that day Love conquers everything We'll cry an anthem singing Holy, holy And when we see that day We're standing that day when we conquers everything we'll cry an anthem singing holy holy and when we see that day when we're standing face to face we'll shout an anthem singing holy holy you took on so not even death can shake us The victor has won And heaven has come And now you're taking us higher Now you're taking us higher We go from glory to glory to Glory. We'll never be the same, we'll never be the same Oh, you take us higher and higher and higher We're forever changed, we're forever changed We go from glory to glory to glory We go, we go from glory to glory and you take us higher and higher and higher We're forever changed, we're forever changed We're forever changed, we're forever changed Yes, Jesus, forever changed, oh Lord author and perfecter of our faith, oh God, this morning. And we thank you, Lord, for the transformation that comes from you, for the change, the deep change, Lord, the heart change uh, that's because of you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. again over your home you are here 
moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. As you are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you, I worship you. You are here. Turning lies around, I worship you. I worship you. You are here, meeting every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 For Jesus, you never change. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel that you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. You make a miracle work, a promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, 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 that is who you are. Promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 
just before we enter into this next song, just take a moment to remind yourself of who God is. What do you need from God? God is the miracle worker, the faithful friend, the compassionate Savior, the righteous Lord, provider, healer. Just take a second and just call out to the Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you for who you are. Thank you, Lord, that we can turn our eyes to you, Lord. <laughs> we turn our, our eyes to the hills where our help comes from. Our help comes from the Lord. Lord, we look to you today. Hallelujah, our 
more time. Hallelujah. And hallelujah, our God reigns. And hallelujah, our God reigns. And hallelujah, our God reigns forever. We're going to sing that one more time. And wherever you're at right now, I just invite you, lift up your hands, lift up your voices. And we're going to declare this with conviction, with assurance that our God reigns. And let's just invite the Holy Spirit into, to fill up the space where we're at. Let's invite him. Let's, let's invite him to manifest his presence. Oh, Lord, we want to experience your presence. Hallelujah. Let's sing this one more time. Hallelujah. And hallelujah. circumstance that is deeply personal in the secret place. Thank you, God, that you're over it, that you're sovereign, that we can put our faith and our trust in you and uh, declare that forever all our days, hallelujah, forever all our days, we will praise you. God, just continue to um, prepare us uh, to receive from your word today, Lord. We're anxious, we're ready uh, to hear from you, Jesus, as we already have. But Lord, continue to open our eyes and, and ears to see and hear what you're doing, God. We thank you and we pray all this in the wonderful, wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks, Nat and Mel, for leading in such an uplifting time of worship. And yes, I'm back at church this morning, and I pray that you will be soon also. What a joy to be with you. I pray today's message will be like a breath of fresh air in your life. I was 10 years old, playing with my friends in a partially constructed apartment complex. I fell through an unfinished floor into the basement on crushed rocks below. The wind was knocked out of me. I couldn't breathe. We thought the, the caretaker of the building was after us, and our, my friends and I were running away, and I left my friends, and I ran into a dark room, but there was no floor in it. And on that basement floor, I'm trying to breathe. I could not breathe, and I was, eventually I had to cry out, and my friends thought I was playing with them and trying to frighten them, but I was dying. I couldn't breathe. And finally, I caught my breath. I could have killed myself. Good thing my parents didn't find out. When you can't catch your breath, you can't do anything. So let's talk more about what it means to breathe. Until a few days ago, none of us knew George Floyd. And it's fair to say that none of us really know him. We don't know his dreams or his pains or his successes or his failures. We don't know if he drank coffee in the morning, if he ate pancakes and eggs. What we know is this 46-year-old African-American 
man begged for his life and cried out for his mother under the knee of a Minneapolis white police officer, Derek Chauvin, who has been fired and charged with murder. George Floyd cried out, I can't breathe. He was not listened to. Initially, he was arrested for allegedly using a counterfeit bill and handcuffed. He did not resist and was put in a police cruiser. Due to his medical distress, an ambulance was called. Then the officer pulled him out and put him on the ground and put his knee on his neck. All of this was recorded in a video of 8 minutes and 53 seconds, which showed the life snuffed out of this gentle giant of 6 feet 6 inches. In the first five minutes of this video, we hear George begging for his life. I can't breathe, but the policeman continues pressing his knee on his neck. Bystanders are crying out, you're killing him. He's in bad shape. And the other officers said, let's roll him over on his side. But the senior officer, Chauvin, says, no, we're good. By the time the ambulance gets there, he's dead. The last, last three minutes of the video demonstrate he was totally unresponsive and was dead after the first five minutes of this ordeal. This was one of the most cold-hearted, cruel, merciless actions I have ever witnessed. It's astounding. The police officer seems to flaunt his ability and to do this with cameras rolling in broad daylight? He clearly believes he's above accountability. The off other officers go along and even help to hold him down. Understand, I'm not here to disrespect our police force as they put their lives on the line each day for us, and they deserve our respect and our support. But this case does make their jobs a little more difficult, and I must respond. I can't breathe. As this is a striking sound from a human being. But these words, I can't breathe, have become a rallying cry for the oppressed and racially discriminated. It's a worldwide cry for the sanctity of life. Like when Cain killed Abel and his blood cried out from the ground. So to his death is a worldwide cry for justice that won't be silent. To counter tragedies, like I can't breathe, we must value four things. Number one, the breath of life is a gift from God. In Genesis 2, verse 7, we read, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. You see, when God made the world, darkness covered everything. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God said, that's good. He said, let's make man in our image. And so he scooped up some dust from the ground and he formed man and got real close and blew breath of life into his nostrils and the man became a living being. We of the human race are breathing the breath of God's life. When you hear the words of George Floyd, I can't breathe. You can't help but connect this with the God's breath in our lives and consider the ultimate relationship between human beings and the living God. As human beings, we must realize how sacred human life is and where our dignity comes from. We are not inferior works of creation. We are not only creations of our own imagination. We are the works of God's own hands. Like a sculptor, God knelt down and shaped us. He bent our curves. He made our nostrils. He formed our chest. Like an engineer, he designed us and refined us and then breathed into us. We bear his signature. We are more than just clay and dust. Adam's body was lifeless until it was directly animated by the Creator. And Adam became an independent, breathing creature. Breath is precious. It's powerful. Maybe that's why when we hear the words, I can't breathe, it seems such a violent crime. 
Who are we to stamp out the breath that only God can put into the body? I can't breathe begs the question of origin, morality, and destiny. In our world, people's physical breath are being in danger. But more than that, their emotional and mental and spiritual breath are being oppressed and destroyed as life is choked out of them. So how do we survive? We all have received the precious breath of life from God in our lungs. But there's another breath God wants to breathe upon us. And this breath is enough to endure injustice and trial and tragedies of any kind. Oh Lord, breathe on us right now. Secondly, to counter tragedies like I can't breathe, we need to value the breath of Jesus. Let me read to you the story of Jesus appearing to his disciples after the resurrection in John chapter 20. On the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again Jesus said, Peace be with you, and the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. The doors are locked shut. The disciples are filled with fear, hiding from Jewish authorities because their mentor was wrongfully accused, humiliated, and ridiculed, and forced to die a slow death on the cross. They watched him take his last breath, and then his body went missing from the tomb. I mean, there were conspiracy theories out there. They were rampant. The government believed the disciples stole the body. And the disciples thought the government stole it to disprove any claims as to the resurrection in the future. In the room, the disciples were praying, Lord, what shall we do now? You're gone. All seemed hopeless. It seemed nothing was going to change. Surely they were thinking, Lord, you told us we were to become fishers of men, and now it seems like we're on the hook. They were afraid hated by many. Their lives were in danger, danger, and they felt as if they were to step outside of those doors, their lives were, would be forfeited. Jesus then all of a sudden enters the room. The disciples could hardly breathe, and he's there in his resurrection body. He doesn't need to, for them to open the locked doors because he is the door. And Jesus is raised from the dead and he leaps victoriously from the grave and he goes to see his disciples. He steps into this tension-filled room and startles his disciples and says, Peace be with you, trying to calm them down. And he shows them his hands and side, essentially saying, They tried to kill me and bury me, but here I stand. And they are overjoyed, and despite all the rioting, hatred, and hurting throughout Jerusalem, again he says, peace be with you. They were hiding and trying to overcome feelings of fear and oppression, but now they recognize him and are filled with joy. And Jesus then breathes upon them to receive the Holy Spirit. It's like Jesus saying to them, this is not the end. The mission I'm sending on you will continue. I kind of think that Jesus here is sort of giving them a kind of spiritual CPR. The minister is about to die and he revives it. He says, receive my breath, my spirit. And he sits down with them and he brings them peace and he helps them to breathe again. And so we cherish the breath of life from God that he gives us. But Jesus wants to breathe on you so you can breathe new life from fear, hopelessness, and oppression. No matter the locked doors of your life, he is not restricted and will come in and speak, peace be with you. Thirdly, to counter tragedies like I can't breathe, we need to value the breath of the Holy Spirit. This isn't just the breath of Genesis 2 of animation bringing alive the lifeless. But it's a breath of empowerment and new life for our soul and our spirit. Listen to how Paul states it in his letter to Titus. He saved us through the rebirth and renewal by this Holy Spirit, 
whom he poured out on us so generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, a rebirth, a renewal, a regeneration comes through the Holy Spirit. True, we need to be outraged, even filled with righteous indignation by recent events. Maybe we need to protest because every life matters, otherwise something's wrong with us. But we must go beyond just valuing life to receiving a fresh wind of God's grace in our lives. To overcome, we need the powerful breath of God's Spirit to surmount all oppression and injustice. On the day of his resurrection, Jesus breathes on them. But this is only the beginning. It's like Jesus is giving them a preview of a coming attraction. It makes, it makes me think of my wife when my kids were young, and she would bake a chocolate cake for someone's birthday. And while the cake was inside the oven, she would take the icing that she was preparing to put on the top, and she, she would have it ready, but then someone had to lick the spoons before you washed them. And I remember my, my kids getting those, those, those spoons and taking the leftovers and licking those spoons. This was a preview of a coming attraction. And it's like when Jesus breathes upon them in the upper room there, all of a sudden he's saying, this is only the beginning, but then the day of Pentecost comes. And listen to what happens next in Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, and suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind, it's like God breathing heavily upon them, came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them, and all of them were filled. Filled with what? The breath of the Holy Spirit. And began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. This Pentecostal experience wasn't the final destination. It was not just for personal blessing and enjoyment. It was not just some introductory or temporary moment in our relationship with Jesus. Pentecost was a new spirit or breath of God empowering his people. This breath of God, though, when it comes into your life, it does disrupt, it does disconnect you from the baggage you carried before. Today, God is stripping us of our baggage that can only happen as His Spirit is breathed upon us. Stripping us of the old ways of culture and traditions of our attitudes that contribute to prejudice and racism. Stripping us of so many things we thought were so important. Throughout this pandemic that we're living, I sense there is a new breath of God being poured out into our lives. It's not the end, but a renewed beginning for many of us. Let this pandemic 2020 be a Pentecost moment as everything is changing and God is doing a new thing among us. We need a power beyond our intellectual strength, more powerful than our mere anger and emotions, beyond all the trouble and confusion of this world. The only way to breathe peacefully again is to be receiving the breath of the Holy Spirit. Souls are crying out. People are broken. Tragedies make us feel at times there's no hope. But Jesus wants to breathe once more into your life and my life by his Spirit because we can't make it in this world without him. We witnessed recently the actual life being squeezed out of another person by someone who thought the other didn't have the right to breathe. No one has the right to breathe more than another. The air I breathe should be as equally valuable as the air that you breathe. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured on all flesh and they spoke in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them in many languages representing many races. And when the Spirit of God is within us, we're able to hear the cry and feel the pain of those around us because God wants to pour His Spirit upon all flesh without exception. Therefore, we have a responsibility to share and protect this life because we haven't deserved it more than anyone else. Fourthly, to counter tragedies like I can't breathe, we need to value the breath of God's Word. 
One of the primary tools God uses to breathe upon us is His Word, that is the Bible. 2 Timothy 3 declares, All Scripture is God breathes, Theonutas, and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. The Spirit, the wind, the breath, the inspiration is God inspires and He expires or breathes out or exhales. Scripture is inspired. It is God breathed. This is what Peter says. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, through uh, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. God breathed out the Word of God and breathed into men as they were inspired and filled with the breath of God. Therefore, Scripture, if it comes from the mouth of God, can't have any errors. If you deny the inerrancy of scriptures, then you must also deny the inspiration of scripture. If it has errors, then you can pick and choose what you feel is right, which makes you God. How arrogant to think that we can judge the word of God. You don't judge this book, but you will be judged by this book because it is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Listen to what God's word says. We are born by the word of God, not of corruptible seed. Heaven and earth will pass away, but not my word. Grass withers and flowers fade, but the word of God stands forever. And God says, my word will not return void. God's word is living and active and sharper than a double-edged sword. I can't make you believe the word of God, but you are saved by faith in it. You have to choose whether you're going to believe that this book is God's word. And but once you believe it's his word, your life is changed forever and you now have a standard for your life. Notice the benefits of the breath of God as his word in our lives. Ezekiel 37 declares, The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by, my spirit, uh, by the spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of the valley and was full of bones. Notice, just bones. It wasn't even a skeleton. And it says, this is what the sovereign list says to the Lord says to these bones, I will make a breath enter you and you will come to life. It seems when the breath of God comes into our lives, through this word he speaks into our lives, four things happen. Number one, it brings understanding. We see in verse 3 of Ezekiel 37, He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. There's some things that only God knows. And we say, Lord, I don't understand what's happening. You must go to God and His Word because God's Word and the breath of the Spirit that's in that Word will bring you understanding. Job 32 says, But it is the Spirit in a person, the breath of the Almighty, that gives them understanding. We need to read the owner's manual from the manufacturer. Number two, the word of God brings order. Verse seven, so I prophesied and I was commanded and I was prophesying. There was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together bone to bone. It's like God brought order out of these disjointed bones. He made them into skeletons. And no matter how chaotic your world might seem, when God's word in your life is breathed into your soul, it brings order to that which is chaotic. Psalm 33 says, By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, their starry host, by the breath of his mouth. And then number three, it brings strength. Verse 6 says, I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life and then you will know that I am the Lord. Tendons connecting muscle to bones. God's word brings structure and order in our life. But we need something to connect us to the power of God, to the muscle of God. And that is the word brings strength in our lives. And then fourthly, uh, we see it brings life. Verse 10 says, So I prophesied and he commanded me and and breath entered them and they came to life and stood up on their feet. It says in Job 33, The Spirit of God has made me. The breath of the Almighty gives me life. 
Friends, we need life from above. We don't just need life in our own soul. We need the breath of God in our lives. When you read this book, you get understanding. Your life comes into order. You get power of God in your life, and you get life itself when you're filled with the breath of God. All week long, I've been breathing and inhaling the Word of God. I've been taking this Word all week long, and I've been taking it like... I've been breathing it in. I've been just breathing this word in. And today I am here breathing out, breathing out to you the life of God found in his word. But one breath of God per week is not enough. You will be oxygen deprived. This week, breathe in God's word for yourself and let that life flow through you that brings understanding, order, strength, and life. For all who say, Lord, I can't breathe. Jesus says to you, receive my breath. On the cross, when he stopped breathing, he died as a sacrifice for your and my sin. Because his breath left his body, the price was paid for us to receive a new breath of life. Jesus' blood was spilled for us all, and therefore we need to value and protect his breath that we receive and value in others. Today is a day where I'm praying that God's breath would be in your life. And I'd like you to pray with me and open your heart, because maybe you're here today and you're saying, Lord, I can't breathe. But he wants to give you new breath because Jesus came. He came to breathe upon you. And the Holy Spirit is here today to give you fresh life as you say, Lord, I can't live just with the breath that I have. There's got to be more. And there is. So let's pray together. Lord God, I pray that you would be with those who listen at this moment that you would draw them to yourself and you would give them a fresh touch this morning. Some people are crying out, I can't breathe in this relationship. I can't breathe in my work. I can't breathe in my own personal feelings of anxiety or, or my own sense of worth or future or destiny. Today, Lord, would you breathe upon these people that are listening in their living rooms or in their homes Lord, breathe upon them. Spirit of God, come fresh upon those that are listening. And Lord, we just thank you today that you give new life. Because you died and rose again, you're giving us resurrection life. And God can bring you back from the dead and give you fresh life today. Just say, Lord, fill me with the Spirit. I need the breath of God today because I want to breathe. Thank you for being with us today. Would you let us know if this message has touched you? We want to be in contact with you, and we want to support you, and we're believing God to continue the work that he's begun in you today. Have a blessed day. I look forward to seeing you again. We want to thank you again for joining us today for this service. So don't don't forget our prayer meeting this Wednesday at 7 p.m. as usual. Uh, why don't you invite someone this week to join with you uh, to connect uh, with us on our Zoom prayer meeting. We also have live worship on Thursday evenings at 7 p.m. And uh, finally, don't hesitate to send me a message. If uh, this service has touched you in some way today, we want to hear about it. We want to hear from you. Um, and so thanks again and uh, see you next time.